welcome back, Katie. Uh, I am Skylar with Lean Frontiers. And um, so Katie Anderson, she is on screen right now. You will be able to talk to her live at Conacon H8 in March. Um, just a reminder that you will receive a link to view the recording within 24 to 48 hours. Uh, and with that, Katie, I do believe our numbers are kind of slowing down, so you can go ahead and take over. All right, great. Well, thanks, Skylar, and thanks, everyone, for being here today. Uh, I'm really excited to be going to Katacon 8. It's my first Katacon because it doesn't conflict with um, my some children's things in my life, so it's going to be great. And what we're going to do today is talk a little bit of a teaser about some of the content that I'm going to be sharing in both my keynote and some of the breakout workshops that we'll be doing at Katacon as well. So I'm gonna share my slides and we'll get started. So today's session for the next half hour is about how to be a catalyst to accelerate learning by leading with intention. And for those of you who don't know me yet, I'm Katie Anderson. I am a leadership coach and lean consultant I'm also now the author of the best-selling book, Learning to Lead, Leading to Learn, Lessons from Toyota Leader Isao Yoshino on a Lifetime of Continuous Learning and the companion workbook that goes with it. Uh, I'm a speaker and in non-pandemic times, I lead learning trips to Japan for leaders at all levels to learn about the foundations of the Toyota way and Kaizen culture. And my purpose is to inspire people around the world to live and lead with intention. And this word intention has a nuance of meaning in my view that helps us stay connected to our purpose. This is made from the symbols. So when I moved to Japan, I needed um, business cards made and the word intention that they put on my card is made up of symbols represent, representing the words heart and direction. And I really see this as about understanding who you wanna be, what's important to you, your purpose, and then what are the actions you need to take to align with that purpose? And so really intention is about aligning with your purpose and fulfilling that purpose as well. Hi everyone too, I'm seeing a lot of people from around the world, um, Canada, Mexico, Oregon, many other states as well, Panama, wonderful. Uh, so what we're gonna be covering today in the next little under 30 minutes is the welcome, which we're here to right now, a definition of what a catalyst is, and then talk a bit about a leader's purpose and the leading to learn framework that I uh, uncover in more detail in the book, Learning to Lead, Leading to Learn. We're gonna talk about these leadership continuums that leaders and coaches have to navigate to successfully align their actions with their purpose. And then I'll invite you to set your intention and ways to continue your own learning and then we will have time for some questions and answers at the end. I'm able to stay for another 10 minutes after the bottom of the hour, or bottom of the hour or two, so we can um, dive into your questions as well. So my intention for you for the next half hour is to have fun, have fun, learn something new, walk away feeling inspired, and with an identified target for how you will become a more effective catalyst in your life and in your organization. Before we get started, for everyone who's here live, I'd like you to set your intention about how engaged you intend to be today for the next half hour we are here together with. So one, and you probably won't even be putting something in because you're not really not paying attention, to seven, fully engaged here, paying attention, planning on uh, listening and being engaged, or four, that you're a little more distracted or you're sort of half here, half not. So please put your intention in. Great to see you there, Sabrina and others, sixes, sixes, sevens, awesome. When we connect with our intention, we have an opportunity to make sure how we need to align and adjust our actions to really be connected with our purpose for being somewhere in the moment. So great to see you all here today. All right, so catalyst or catalyst. The definition we learned probably in, back in school, I remember being in middle school in science class, learning about what a catalyst is. So it's an event or person or something that accelerates the rate of change or someone or something who encourages progress or change. I like to think about the word catalyst when we look about 
how do we practice the routines that encourage scientific thinking. We think about the word kata, meaning routine or practice routine in Japanese. That a kata list, it is an event or person that accelerates the rate of scientific thinking and improvement, or someone or something that encourages learning as a source of progress or change. So we can be the kata list, practicing the routines developed at Toyota based on how we create a learning organization and a learning pattern for ourselves and the people that we are with so that we can accelerate learning across our organization. And this is fundamentally connected with the real secret to Toyota is its attitude towards learning. So without even knowing it or having these same words, Toyota has created a culture where everyone is connected to each other to help each other learn and develop and solve those important problems. And it's this attitude, not the tools or the processes that really has accelerated their success in the part of the, uh, I guess the, the secret sauce that at times we have missed when we've just looked at the visible tools and techniques. I had the great fortune and um, honor in my life to have befriended and known Toyota leader Isao Yoshino. He worked at Toyota for over 40 years in the 1960s up to the early 2000s. And he was the manager of John Shook, who many of you might know uh, as the author of Managing to Learn about A3 Thinking, as well as um, the chairman of the um, Lean Global Network. And John was the first non-Japanese employee of Toyota Motor Corporation. Mr. Yoshino was up on stage over seven years ago, talking about his role as a manager and helping develop John. And he said, my aim as a manager was to develop John by giving him a mission or target and supporting him while he figured out how to reach that target. And as I was developing John, I was aware I was developing myself as well. This is the same pattern that Mike Rother observed and identified as the basis of the Toyota Kata framework that he has developed. This is the unspoken and undocumented pattern of behavior. What's the target or the challenge? How do I help support someone get there? And what do I need to learn and improve in myself to be more effective at both? I've really come to see that a leader's purpose is so simple, although not necessarily easy to do. It is about setting that direction, providing support, and developing yourself at the same time. And this is what I call the leading to learn framework. And you can dive into that a lot more in the book. All of these tools and frameworks that have emerged from Toyota are grounded in these principles. So here's A3 thinking, and this is the book that John Shook wrote. And in fact, Mr. Yoshino and Mr. Yoshino's direct report, Ken Kinyeda, were the models for the manager character Sanderson in the book, and John Shook was the model for the, uh, for the Desi character, the, the learner. A3 thinking is not about just filling out a template. It is about the learning process that happens, the routine of behavior that happens between two people, someone who's owning a problem and someone who's coaching the problem-solving thinking. This is really how we're developing catalysts in our organization. The same with Hoshin Conry. It's on a larger scale and cycle, but there are built-in times and structures about what's our big challenge? How are we gonna solve that? How are we gonna work together? And what improvement do we need to make? This is the same framework for the Toyota Kata. What's our direction or challenge? That needs to be set by the leader. What's the current condition and how is someone moving through there? And again, all grounded in the PDSA or um, SAPD cycles. So a leader's purpose, setting the direction, is about providing that direction, challenge, or target that helps someone know where they need to orient their learning and their problem-solving um, activities. It's also important to set a target or a challenge based on not what's needed, not just by what is just achievable or what we think is achievable. Mr. Yoshino likes to talk about seemingly impossible targets. The word seemingly is really, really important here though, because it's not like definitely impossible. It feels like a stretch for us, but it's based on what's needed and it stretches us and stretches our minds because it's what you learn from those lessons of not immediately reaching your target that actually is based 
on the foundation of learning and it helps you get smarter and more wise. So this is what accelerates the learning. So one important uh, aspect of being a catalyst is setting stretches of challenges that help us get out of our mind and think of new possibilities. This leader's second purpose is providing support. And this is about creating the conditions for learning. And again, it's about setting that challenge that pushes people, but also providing that support through coaching, through guiding, through teaching, through asking questions that allows someone to keep ownership of a problem, but still develop and feel like that they are not floundering or that they do not um, have any support out there to move forward. And this is what the learning zone is. So this is that, that same component that Mike Rother talks about that, um, oh, I'm even forgetting the name, but in, the, in that slide there, it's that, that area that we don't know. It's the, we need to move past that, but we need to be allow for some struggle, for some uncertainty and allow that process of learning to happen. And this is the, this is the true catalyst activities as well. Thank you, the knowledge threshold. I had a, a little bit of brain rip. So that knowledge threshold is between that seemingly impossible challenge and the support, and that we have some struggling that's gonna happen because that's where the learning really happens. We also need to create a culture and an environment where people are not afraid of making mistakes. And this is such a critical component to the overall um, environment that feels safe. We, to experiment, to move forward and try something towards a seemingly impossible target. And to know that we aren't gonna have perfection immediately. Some of you may have heard me or Mr. Yoshino talk about this paint story from his first few months when he worked at Toyota. You can in fact hear Mr. Yoshino tell it in his own words on Mark Graben's My Favorite Mistake podcast from January of 2021. But the short of it was is he made a big mistake. He poured the wrong paint and solvent into a vat and over a hundred cars had to be repainted. But instead of his managers yelling at him or blaming him, they came up to him and asked him for the process that he went through to pour the paint together. And not only did they not blame him, they thanked him for making that mistake because it became clear that they hadn't created the conditions for him to be successful at his work. And so what a powerful experience for him. And he then paid that forward to others as well. So this is where we're accelerating a culture where people feel like they can experiment and learn forward as well. So his managers were two true catalysts for scientific thinking and learning in their organization and expanding his own capabilities for doing the same. So the leader's third purpose is about developing yourself. And it's, so this is not just about everyone else needs to change and improve. It's about knowing that in an organization, we are all business conditions also that require improvement and that our actions, our pattern of behavior, our own personal kata can either have us be kata lists, which are helping accelerate the rate of change and learning in our organization, or they can actually inhibit that. And sometimes our actions inhibit learning and problem solving without us even being aware that that's what's happening. And this is one of the biggest challenges I see for leaders and coaches, and frankly, it was for myself as well that we know we wanna be creating an organization filled with problem solvers. We wanna help people, but sometimes our actions of how we show up don't necessarily uh, align with that. So what we need to do to be more effective catalysts in our organization is learn to navigate these leadership continuums. So it's not just telling or having all the ideas and advocating for a position or asking, showing up to only ask open-ended questions and help someone we need to know the balance of when to tell and when to ask. It's not that we are only experts or coaches. It's how do we own our content knowledge and our expertise that we've developed over time, as well as coach and develop others so that they can develop their own expertise and capabilities for problem solving and moving forward on the big important challenges that they have ownership for. It's about setting both a challenge and providing, or it's not just a challenge or support, it's both. How can we provide a seemingly impossible target, a stretch challenge, but enough support that helps people move through that learning zone? And it's not just looking at business outcomes or how do we create value for our customers, all the process outcomes that we need. 
or focusing on business or people development, how can we do both at the same time? So when we get more sophisticated and more comfortable with these leadership continuums, we know that we can apply the right thing at the right time based on what the person needs or the situation needs. And this is how we continue to accelerate our own abilities to be catalysts in our organizations. One of the challenges I observe is that we are stuck in a firefighting mode all the time. And when we are firefighting, we end up leaning too much on this left side, the telling, the expert, the, the challenge and the business outcomes as the top priority. And we forget to navigate more to the other side. And it's the other side or somewhere in between that actually allows the space for growth and development for people. So how do we also know what are true emergencies that need to be fixed now, all hands on deck? And there, there are those situations, absolutely. But where can we give more space, a little bit more time for thinking, a little more time for experimentation and failure and be there to help support someone as well through their learning process? And this is an important condition for us to be effective catalysts in our organizations as well. When I talked about the challenges that we have for um, this disconnect often between our intended purpose and outcome with how our actions are aligned is that we often show up more in telling versus asking. An unintended consequence of us giving the answer or telling people exactly what to do is that it takes over the responsibility for them to work through that problem. And you end up owning the problem solving or create this vicious cycle where everyone comes to you for all of the answers. You are not being a true catalyst in your organization. Now, of course, there is sometimes that telling is really right, but how do we keep ownership of problem solving with other people while helping them move forward as well? So this then self-perpetuates this condition of feeling overwhelmed and then continuing to be more telling, to be more directive, um, to showing up more as the expert who has the answers rather than more as that coach. And this is what I call the advocacy inquiry continuum. So we need to find a balance and really understand, is this my problem to own or is this someone else's problem or challenge and how can I help them best move forward? And the way to do this is really to focus on how you can navigate the coaching continuum more effectively. And this is what the, the pattern of the Toyota Kata is all about. This is the pattern that, that true A3 thinking and coaching is about as well. How do you have someone, how do you help someone move from being a novice to an expert in problem solving? And how do you move between being directive and teaching and demonstrating when they're just a beginner, but not taking over the responsibility for the problem solving and then how they get more advanced with the complexity of the problems that they have ownership for. So coaching is not just only asking questions. Asking questions is very, very important. It's about knowing when do we need more teaching to walk alongside someone to demonstrate how they, a next step that they might take. So when we can get better about knowing what the learner needs to move forward, we are a more effective catalyst. We need to often practice how to ask more open coaching questions because our habit is to be more telling, but we don't wanna only be stuck on the asking side. We need a balance based on what the other person needs. So the way that you can amplify your impact is not just being the only problem solver and developing your own capabilities. It's about how can you help others develop their capabilities. And this is how we are catalysts that accelerate the rate of learning and amplify our impact and the organization's impact as well. And as I like to say, one plus one equals much more than two. So this is where the catalyst, it accelerates it and expands it. And we really create an attitude towards learning as well as capability and confidence across the people that are in our sphere of influence as well. So again, I encourage you to think about how you can become a catalyst in your organization. What are the things that you need to do to accelerate the rate of scientific thinking and improvement in your organization and to see learning as the source of progress or change. So I advocate not just for having being catalyst with a C, but catalyst with a K. And to use that hashtag too, when you're thinking about 
How are we accelerating the rate of change and scientific thinking in our organizations? So we're, this has been a big flash and I really look forward to having some more discussion here. I wanna anchor you on where we have come from and where we're going. Um, we've talked about the definition of a catalyst and the leading to learn framework, as well as some of these leadership continuums to have awareness of that you need to navigate to be an effective catalyst. I now wanna invite you how to continue your learning and develop these skills for yourself, for you to set your intention and then any questions and discussion you'd like to have. So I'm really thrilled that uh, later this week, I am launching the third live cohort of my Leading to Learn Accelerator. And there are some people here who are live who've been uh, ex past Accelerator students. I saw Gabrielle and Sabrina as well in the, um, in the chat. Would love to have you come on this learning journey as well. This is a way to help develop not only your problem solving capabilities, but your coaching skills about how you can develop learning in your organization as well. And it's a 12 week program where it's mainly online and self-paced with bi-weekly group coaching calls with me and a community cohort as well. We'll dive into the lessons from learning to lead, leading to learn, and really give you tangible experiences and practices that you can take to really accelerate your own learning so that you can accelerate the rate of learning for others as well. So thank you, Gabriella, and to Sabrina saying str strong recommend, amazing course, it's a real journey. And I can only recommend the Leading to Learn Accelerator to all. It's been a pleasure to have you in my uh, chain of learning. And for everyone here live or watching through the end of the week, um, I have a early preview pricing too. You can get $100 off if you use the code CAUTILIST100. So, uh, go forward and do that or reach out if you have any questions. I'd love to have you there. And I just noticed I'm wearing the same blazer. So very exciting. Um, so with that, I'd like you to set your intention to align your actions with your purpose. So can you please put, in, put into the chat or write down for yourself if you're watching this later, what will you practice to become a more effective catalyst for learning in your organization? One, one thing that you're going to practice, please put that in the chat. All right. so Jose says, listen more before offering ideas. Let's see some other ones. Thanks, everyone. So we can ask you more questions, open-ended questions. Uh, yeah, thank you, Gabriella. It's amazing falling into the telling trap, we all do. So um, starting discussion and tension before a meeting starts, develop the learning skills, great. We all have the capability to be the catalyst in our organization. So the more that we can be aware of how our actions align with our purpose and, our, and, and lead with intention each and every other day to help others learn and to help ourselves learn as well, we're gonna be most effective. So I would love to hear your one word that describes your learning experience here today as an open question to you and put that into the chat. And then again, we can go into some questions and some discussion here. I also wanna invite you to keep learning together. If we're not already connected on LinkedIn or Twitter or Facebook, you can find me there. Uh, again, you can get $100 off the next Leading to Learn Accelerator that's starting the first week in March. If you register by the end of this week with the coupon code CATALYST100. And I do have a free resource on my website about how you can break your telling habit. And you can go here at kbjanderson.com slash telling dash habit. So um, you can go there and would love to dive into some questions. And if you have any questions about the accelerator, please reach out to me. Um, I'm really, really excited. Almost hundred people have gone through the program in the last year and I wanna help you accelerate your rate of learning as well. So, all right. Um, all right, so let's move to some questions. Katie, I did just send you um, a couple of anonymous questions to your chat. Okay. Um, all I'll right, so, so one of the questions is innovation, learning, terms paraded in so many meetings, what are some of the barriers that get in the way? Um, yeah, I, if you were here and we were able to have a dialogue, I'd say I would ask a question to learn more about what was coming from behind that question. Because when we can dig a little bit deeper and hear really what was, um, 
behind a question, we can understand how to respond so much more. So I will, um, I'll just respond based on my, um, my own experience here that the innovation and learning, some of the things that get, are the barriers that get in the way. And I ask this actually almost in every workshop that I do, what are the things that inhibit learning, problem solving and innovation in our organizations? And some of the common themes that come up are um, fear. So fear of being blamed if they're not right, fear of being assigned the problem and like you already are overwhelmed by everything you have, fear of not being right. Um, also, people feel overwhelmed that they have too many priorities and too many things going on already, um, or they don't have the time. Um, and then another thing that's usually mentioned often is that they're told what to do or not given the space to contribute their ideas. And this is really connected to this challenge of telling versus asking, is that many times leaders come in with, this is where we need to go, but this is exactly what we're gonna do and how to do it. And so it actually inhibits people from feeling like they can come forward with their creativity and their ideas to help contribute towards problem solving or innovation. So those are some of the things that get in the way. So one of the simplest shifts that you can make is start asking more questions and giving some space for learning or people bringing forward their ideas. And so the, the telling habit guide can really help you with that one. What are some other questions people have? Yep, so thank you, Ashok, who said, common issues are lack of empowerment and opportunity and mistakes create a culture to check, uh, to check out your brain when signing on for the job. Absolutely, so we need, if we wanna create a culture where everyone has, is able to solve problems and contributes towards it, we also have to see how our actions and behaviors or those of the people around us are also contributing to that culture. Um, Katie, we do have one that came in, or uh, another one. What can you do as a leader when your team is stuck in firefighting mode? Mm, yeah, so I've been working with a, a large healthcare organization right now because especially in the pandemic, it's exacerbated this firefighting as well. We have been in a crisis and all hands on deck. Um, and so we've been talking about how can you start making su small, subtle shifts in places because it's this self-perpetuating environment. So when can you say, I'll give you a day to do some thinking here or showing up asking a few more questions opposed to just always rushing from meeting to meeting and to event to event and just being reactive rather than proactive. So finding those spaces where you can give even a little bit of an opportunity for learning or thinking um, and being more self-aware on, is this truly a crisis that has to be fixed now? Or is this something that might be better solved if we had even a day or two or 10 minutes to do a little bit deeper thinking on it? So. I see uh, Jose has a question about recommendation how to coach up, meaning to convince upper management that we need to do things differently. Yeah, um, I mean, this is, a, like, this is a hard one, right? I think for my experience, one of the, no matter, no matter if you're coaching up to senior leaders or just coaching to, you know, trying to influence um, from anywhere is to help people see the outcomes that they're experiencing and then help them walk backwards and maybe see the impact of behaviors or actions and how they're contributing to that. So starting with, well, what, you know, what is the outcome or goals that they want, that they want to have? And then going through the, almost that problem solving and visibility process as well to think about, okay, well, how, what's the impact of when, you know, I, I don't know what the situation is, but to have that conversation and hold up the mirror with real evidence, not your, um, I guess the assessment of it, but like uh, observations of this is what's happening and how are you seeing the impact of that and how are those connected? Um, I'm looking at, uh, Leanne, oh, so Pam says, where can I start this in a family-owned bit company? Just like with anywhere, I think just starting with setting, understanding like what are the targets, what are the goals we need to achieve, and then asking questions and helping people contribute their thinking about how we're going to get there. So uh, like, what's the target? What's actually happening? This is the gap. Let's do some problem solving together. Let's do some thinking together. Or why don't you do some thinking and we'll come back and look at that. 
So you can get started at anywhere and you don't need to be a leader with a title like a manager or a senior executive to do this. You can lead through influence as well. Um, let's see, in, in encouraging lead by example and growing my sphere of influence, I find recurring challenges with more senior experienced colleagues who come across as if they're past learning, but expect others to learn and grow. Ah, how do you effectively work with those people? Yeah, that's definitely a challenge um, because sort of an inherent part of learning is having the humility to know that you aren't perfect and that there are, are always opportunities for, for more growth. Um, I would say it goes back to my, my earlier comment too, is about how can you help hold up the mirror to the impact of someone's actions and help them reflect on that. Um, and just starting to do a little bit of teaching on there too, uh, as well. But that's definitely a challenge when people are like, I don't need to change, I'm, I'm perfect. <laughs> so, um, but helping, helping them see that maybe the, the things that are happening as a result of things they're doing are maybe not connected with what they actually want to be seeing in, in the organization. Uh, sorry, I'm scrolling down all the questions here. Uh, Oh yeah. So, oh, yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was probably just going to read you the one that you're at. <laughs> okay. Uh, so Mark says working with nearly hundred percent remote teams, what strategies do you recommend for helping a catalyst see the teachable learning moments when so much work is being done out of sight? Yeah, that's a great comment. Um, and sorry, great, great question there. And one that, you know, we're all challenged with like the, like, how do we go to Gemba or the, the word in Japanese, which means the place the work is done. How do we really observe um, observe what's happening? So a few thoughts on that. First is, you know, when in the same way that I might be coaching someone in person, when I was observing them in a meeting and standing at the back of the room and just writing down some observable evidence of what was happening, like what they were actually saying and what the impact was, I can do the same thing if I'm observing them in a Zoom meeting. So I have to be, it's, you know, it's a little different, but I could do that same, that same thing. Um, same thing of observing and coaching with people, how they're communicating with each other and doing problem solving, asking them to come forward and share a problem with, with you or something that they're working on or seeing people like practice coaching with each other. There are those opportunities as well. And you certainly can have, you know, you have your phone and someone could like, <laughs> it's not as easy, but to go around and see what they're doing or have them show, um, show your screen. So as much as we can make things visible and visual, but also focus on evidence and observation, not just talking about how things are going, but how, what are those opportunities, even in a remote way, that you can see people engaging with others or engaging through a problem solving process and then providing some observable evidence um, and some, then some reflection time for them, for you to help them move forward. Uh, yeah, holding up the mirror makes sense. Yeah. So, right. So how do you, how do you help them see what's going on? Cause we, we all have our blind spots and we can't necessarily see the impact of the actions that we're having, or we may think we're asking a lot of great questions, but we're really asking leading questions that are not true, genuine questions that are telling with a question mark on it. So yeah, thanks everyone. Any, what if any other questions you have? Katie, I have another one. I'm sending it to your chat. Yes. How to ask questions that are not as generic as on a Kata card, but relevant to the actual problem being addressed. Great question. I actually recorded a video about this. I'm going to pull it up because I have my little, I have like my box of little note cards so that I'm not always on slides. Um, ah, where did it go? Uh, it may not be in here. Okay. Uh, but it's, how do you ask questions? So it's knowing going through the problem solving process and I'll, I'll have, uh, Skylar share the link to this too, but I'm always going through a problem solving process and even thinking about what's the target, what's actually happening, what's the gap, how are you thinking about the gap, what's really happening, asking those questions that still go through the problem solving process but aren't necessarily as prescriptive um, as the, the, the starter kata questions that Rother has identified as a way of practicing. He never intended those questions on the card to be the only questions to ask. It was a way of starting to build that, the muscles of asking questions in a problem solving, I guess, framework to help others. So um, how do you still understand like getting clarity on what's the target? What's actually happening? What's the real gap? 
What's one thing you're going to try to close that gap? What do you expect to happen? What did you learn? And so just asking that pattern of questions um, in a row, I use sort of the A3 framework. What's the background? What should be happening? What's actually happening? What's the problem? What are some of the contributing factors? What are some ideas you have to close those contributing factors? What's the next experiment you're going to run? What did you learn from that? What adjustments are you going to make? So going through that same cycle can feel more authentic to you, but still following the same intention of that kata pattern that Rother had originally identified. I have another one. So oh, do you find any pre-evaluation or assessment for fit when partnering with a new learner with a coach? Uh, I don't in particular, um, you know, I, of course, when I'm working with someone, I think it's different to um, back when I was internal coach and consultant um, in healthcare organizations, you know, you got partnered with a good leader and you have, or just a leader, you got partnered with them. And it's so important to be able to establish the rapport together. Um, so I don't have necessarily a, a, a pre-evaluation or an assessment, but I think it's really important that there is trust and some sort of rapport between people. And as a coach, you can help develop that trust and rapport by having some contracting conversations that showing that you're really, your, your, your role, your purpose is there to help that person learn and grow and to have some conversations about um, how you're gonna work together. Now, there are some times that things aren't a fit and then you have to have those challenging conversations too, but um, your role as a coach is to have the structures for learning and that should be able to fit most people as well. Uh, yeah, great comment, uh, Gina, that use the Kata coaching questions as a baseline, but dig deeper with those open-ended questions that, that are still true open inquiry questions. So absolutely. A great comment. And the questions are great for establishing that framework, but it's not, they're not the only questions. Yeah. Katie, that is all the questions I have. All right. Send some in. Great. Well, great. And I, uh, I thank you so much. I'm Pam, I'm glad this was helpful for you and really timely. Um, hope to see some of you at the Katacon conference and we'll dive into this more detail in March. And again, I'd love to have some of you join me for the Leading to Learn Accelerator to really help you accelerate your skills and dive into the how of doing this much more effectively over the next 12 months. So uh, yes, thank you, John. SAPD, I, I was on a debate last night about PDCA versus SAPD. So study, adjust, plan, do, because reflection is the beginning and not the end of learning. So thanks everyone for being here. And I look forward to connecting with you soon. Thank you so much, Katie, for joining us again today. Um, we look forward to seeing you live at Codicon 8. And thank you to everybody who participated in today's webinar, sending us your questions and everything. Um, we do appreciate you. Also, um, just a reminder, you will receive a link to view the recording within 24 to 48 hours. Everyone, you have a great rest of your day. Bye, everyone. Thanks for Bye. being here. Thank you, Katie. Thanks, Skylar.